Good morning, everybody. And I think we saw one perspective of the word social. So when we talk about social, there are two ideas to it. One is that how to make a social progress. And when we talk about social progress, that means how do we understand the needs at the different levels, at the levels of the states, at the levels of the cities, at the levels of the districts. Because once those needs are identified, then the corporates pitch in and try to eliminate those needs using the different kind of business models. One of them can be the shared value business models. So now I would like to invite Justin Barkley from Shared Value Initiative to share his perspective on shared value business models. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Now, here's what I have to tell you. Usually when somebody does this, you're thinking, okay, here's the guy that got up this morning and he needed a little energy from the audience, so he asked for another good morning. But what I'm gonna tell you, give me, let me give you a little hint. For the next four to maybe eight years, any American you meet is gonna need a little self-affirmation from you, okay? So that's really what that was. So let's, good morning. Thank you, thank you, I feel a lot better. I don't think that's gonna solve any of the joint problems that we have, but I do feel a little bit better as I stand up here. Americans are gonna need your moral support for the next four to eight years at least, depending on how much damage we can do in the next four to eight years. So as Sandeep said, what's that? It's a good question, and I, I love uh, starting talks with questions. I, I think it's interesting. I will answer that, though, because if you think about it, <clears throat> eight years ago, Barack Obama ran on a change platform. And for all the things you can say about Donald Trump, and there are many, I think he ran on a change platform. But what we see is, and I think the difficulty, and it does connect to this work and this conversation, is uh, the systemic challenges facing our society uh, that are very much linked to the role of businesses, the role of government, as Dr. De Broglie just talked about here in India, um, are absolutely hard to uh, change in the next four to eight years. So I do think you could see a, a sort of pendulum swing back and forth as various candidates try to take on these systemic issues. So as Sandeep said, my name is Justin Backley. I'm the executive director of the Shared Value Initiative globally. So I spend my time uh, all around the world in conversations like this one uh, talking about what we're seeing in the shared value movement uh, from a global level, but also I like to spend a lot of time, and I will do so today, listening to all of your experiences and really trying to get up to speed on the shared value concept here in India. I don't really want to, uh, you know, reflect too much on the election. I can assure you that I am already exhausted from the breathless moment-to-moment -moment news cycle updates on what's happening in seemingly every instance uh, in the United States now that we've elected Donald Trump as president. But what I'd rather ask you, because I do think this is relevant to think about, is what does the U.S. election, Brexit, almost anti-globalization uh, move, what does it mean to the global business community? What does it mean to the business leaders in this room? And I'll offer you two potential thoughts that I have. First of all, I think what it gives us is it gives us a big dose of uncertainty. Uncertainty is not good for businesses. It's not good for long-term planning. Most businesses do not operate well in um, moments of long-term operational uncertainty. I think that's the bad news right now. I think the good news, and where I'd like to spend uh, my time this morning addressing all of you, is I think this provides us with an amazing moment for business leadership. For real business leadership focused on how to take on the pressing social and environmental issues of our day, whether that's in India, whether it's in the United States, uh, or the other places around the world that we, that we work. You know, we had an event about 10 days ago in New York that included the no noted development expert Jeff Sachs. And Jeff was talking about, from where he sits, of course, working with the UN, Sustainable Development Goals, at that multilateral global level, he was talking to that audience filled with pharmaceutical medical device company executives, talking about the power that companies have. 
the power to affect change on social and environmental issues and what they can bring to the conversation. That was before the election, by the way. And I think those comments are even more pointed today, now in this Brexit post uh, Donald Trump election moment. And it's important to point out that I believe we were already in a moment of massive change. And in fact, I really appreciated Dr. Dubroy's comments because he was pointing at the change that we see globally too. He said government can't do it alone. Government can't solve all the problems of the societies in which they govern. And surely enough, the way we see the world through the Shared Value Initiative is this reallocation of who's doing what between the sectors. And those of you who were with us at our partner day yesterday for the Shared Value Initiative India, now I refer to this as tectonic plates moving between civil society and business and government of who does what to solve social problems. And the tenor of this conversation has changed tremendously even in the last five to 10 years. With the classic thought being that uh, governments and civil society solve problems and companies uh, create them uh, or create a lot of them and pay taxes and provide employment but at the same time uh, create environmental problems uh, and, and that narrative is changing quite dramatically and you see it in all sorts of um, of instances where business is now at the table as a partner in solving social problems in a way that they weren't before. The Paris Climate Change Accords. What's the role of business in helping with climate change? The development of the SDGs. Again, Jeff Sachs. 15 years ago when the Millennium Development Goals were developed, I think it was Jeff Sachs and three other people sitting in a room. Business was not there. And I think the really positive thing is that now business also sees these, and again, this is for us the shared value mindset, as opportunities for innovation and growth. And when you listen to the way people talk in these conversations, it's not just about how is business going to pay, because that isn't, of course, how businesses think. So I think businesses then, in this moment that we're in, have a wonderful chance to exhibit real leadership. And it's probably no surprise that I think that the businesses, especially those in this room right now, who are the most well-placed to show that leadership are those who have advanced the farthest on the shared value agenda. Businesses that are advancing prosperity, and my friend David Wilcox will come back to this point in his comments, who are advancing prosperity linked to their businesses and society at scale will be at a distinct advantage in this world. Why? Why will businesses be at an advantage if they can talk knowledgeably about these matters related to their business? Number one, because they will be able to illustrate the linkage between the social issues related to their business and the prosperity they're creating and measure it, as Dr. DeBroy talked about as well. And that will be of great advantage to them. Number two, importantly, because companies talk about a lot of things, there's a lot of things they do to engage in society, but in particular, in initiatives that are reaching scale, they can differentiate between the talk and the actual delivery of social progress and prosperity. These are very important distinguishing things and it will be very easy to see which companies are making meaningful progress at scale on the issues related to the business and those who are talking about uh, issues but that have not reached that same scale. So what I wanna talk about today is I wanna give you three examples of where I think companies are pushing the envelope that are going much further than just shared value initiatives. And in fact, the next panel discussion is shared value, you know, an initiative or an enterprise level. What is it that we're going for? And we'll hear some examples. But I wanna push you on three examples that, we've, that we're observing globally of where companies are going the furthest. And the demand I have for all of you as you listen to these three examples is to ask yourself, how far is your company, or if you're a nonprofit, if you're partnering with companies, how far are you going along these dimensions? Do these examples feel like things you're talking about within your organizations, or are they much further along than where you're at? So here are the three, three quick stories. Number one, companies who are really rethinking entire business models, reimagining the business that they are in, related to the social issues that are relevant to their business. So let me give you an example. 
uh, talked about this again at Partner Day yesterday, but NL is a $100 billion Italian utility company. If there's anyone in the room that works in a utility business, I don't mean to insult you, but at least where I come from, we don't think of utility businesses as necessarily being the most innovative. Oftentimes, they, they straddle the line between a public good or a state-owned enterprise and a privately held corporation. And yet, NL, as a $100 billion company, really, really fit in that model. They basically are the energy company of Italy with massive fixed assets in coal-fired plants, in oil and gas plants, and the primary energy generator and deliverer in Italy. And they said to themselves when they made the move from being a state-owned enterprise to a, to a privately held uh, business or a, a business that was floated on the stock exchange, they said, where are we going to get growth? What does the next stage of growth look like for NL? One of the things they did was they bought a utility company in Spain and grew that way, but that was also traditional. But the next thing they did was they started saying, well, we think the future of energy generation is going to be in green power, in renewables, solar, wind, uh, geothermal, hydro, and not in these massive fixed assets that we have in a very traditional business in Italy. So they started building out this business model, NL Green Power, and in fact, they were so unsure of how it would connect or not with their legacy business that they actually spun it off into a business called NL Green Power. And they started building out massive energy generation in Latin America, in North America, in Sub-Saharan Africa at scale. And to Sandeep's introduction, what were they doing? They were innovating around a business model of how to build a green business, a green power business at scale in these places in the world that were seriously lacking access to energy as a social issue. So that in and of itself I think would be interesting, but of course there's many companies that are innovating, uh, in particular new, new stage, early stage companies innovating in alternative energy. The way the story ends up to me is almost the more interesting part, which is as that part of the business started to grow, the parent company in Italy realized wait, it seems like we've kind of made a mistake. We've actually taken the part of the business that has the high growth potential, and we've spun it off and made it its own company. So they decided to buy it back. They bought the whole thing back, NL Green Power, and reincorporated it into NL as an overall organization. And what happened when they did that is probably the most fascinating part of the story, which is they took the management team from NL Green Power, who was steeped in innovation, who were steeped in how to think differently about the business and legacy assets, and they made them the management team of the entire company. And the most recent commitment they've made now is within Italy, within this legacy business, traditional utility business, they have committed to replacing with green power the fixed assets, $20 billion of fixed assets in coal and oil generation plants in Italy to transform the entire business, not just the new parts that they're building. So number one, are you rethinking, are you thinking innovatively in a business like this about how to rethink the entire business and what it can mean for your competitiveness and also positioning for where the world's going, in this case, around energy? Example number two, are you thinking about how you're redefining your competitive boundaries? Redefining what it means to compete. So let me give you an example. We've worked in Coco in Cote d'Ivoire for since 2008. And we we're talking at the table here about cocoa and Cote d'Ivoire. There's uh, about a million farmers in Cote d'Ivoire alone who are all small scale farmers. And the industry produces about 40% of the world's cocoa. So if you have any chocolate today during the day, that, uh, the cocoa that's in that chocolate is most likely coming from either Ghana, Cote d'Ivoire, uh, Cameroon, or Nigeria. It's about 70% of the world's cocoa. And if you add Indonesia, you have 90%. So Cote d'Ivoire, though, needs a massive reinvestment to regenerate that uh, cocoa supply. And it's the one ingredient in chocolate that is irreplaceable. So it is a massive problem for any company, Nestle, Mars, Cargill, ADM, anyone who's a part of that cocoa supply chain has a massive business issue related to the quantity and quality of cocoa. Now, the traditional way of going about this is each one of those companies would have their little program, they would have their little set of investments, they would work with a thousand farmers here, they'd work with um, you know, 5,000 farmers there. But there are a million farmers in Cote d'Ivoire alone. 
And in fact, just to give you an example, at one point, one of the companies, I won't say which one, made a big announcement. They said, we're going to regenerate 1 million trees for cocoa farmers in Cote d'Ivoire. 1 million trees. Well, there was just one problem. We had done the math, and we realized to regenerate the sector, there were somewhere in the neighborhood of 2.5 to 3 billion trees in Cote d'Ivoire. Size of problem, size of commitment, and a huge get. The industry to see was they don't compete on sourcing cocoa. They compete on things like Kit Kat or Mars or M&Ms. They compete with consumers. They don't compete on what it looks like to invest in that sector in Cote d'Ivoire. In fact, most of the companies didn't have an employee. They didn't have anyone who even worked there. Yet it was a joint problem that they all had. And time and time again, you can look at different industries and see they are confronting joint problems that they can't solve on their own and they're starting to rethink what it looks like to, to collaborate with one another to address these joint problems. At this event we had with Jeff Sachs uh, that I mentioned a few weeks ago, it was pharmaceutical and medical device companies. Guess what? Every single one of them in, in India, every single one, doing their own programs, their own activities. And yet, the conversation turns to, in partnership with the government of India, is there an opportunity for us to align because we would all benefit from better healthcare access and delivery, yet our investments on our own are subscale and substandard. So are you redefining, rethinking about your competitive boundaries and thinking about the places where even with your most ardent competitors, you might have a shared interest in improving prosperity that benefits you both? Number three. Are you expanding your view on more holistic work that really crosses the boundaries between sectors? So what does that mean? So we look at the example of Yara in East Africa. Uh, and some of you may be familiar with the Southern Agricor Agricultural Growth Corridor of Tanzania. A massive effort. Yara viewed it, Yara's a fertilizer company from Norway. Yara viewed it as an opportunity to start selling their products to small scale farmers. It was a growth opportunity for Yara. How do we deliver a product to a place where we think we can build a business? Yet it was a part of Tanzania that was, um, had, been, had massive underinvestment, and there was no way as a single investment in building a fertilizer delivery facility that that was going to unlock growth for Yara because Yara needed everything else that was required to support that business. They needed not only the support of government and civil society, but they needed people working on infrastructure. They needed people working on farmer training. They needed people working on health care to make sure that those farmers were healthy. So how do you think about what full sector-to-sector uh, -sector collaboration looks like? Again, for the companies that's unlocking growth, for governments that's delivering prosperity and social progress that they are interested in, and for civil society working in those places, obviously aligned with their mission uh, to help the people in the, in the places in which they're working. So these are three ways that we see that companies are really pushing in new boundaries. Again, to recap, rethinking entire business models, challenging long-held assumptions about what business you're in and what the opportunities or limitations are. Number two, rethinking where the businesses actually compete on social issues. And number three, expanding sector-to-sector -sector, um, collaboration in a way that Generates, benef generates benefits for all. And if any of you have seen it, so we just wrote an article in the Harvard Business Review called The Ecosystem of Shared Value. And it basically lays out this exact thought. And in the simplest terms, the way to think about it is, for companies pursuing shared value, those things that are within the four walls of the company are the easiest to control. So if you're investing in an efficiency of your supply chain, if you're investing in efficiency of a plant or a production facility, those are the easiest places to make progress. But it's also the places where the gains that are potentially had are limited to the footprint of that company. And immediately as the company starts moving out to opportunities like the ones that I've described, the need for partners and the control that goes down in what a company can accomplish on its own diminishes as well, bringing up the need for partnerships. So, what's it mean? I think the two most substantial barriers to further shared value progress are these. Because the key question is, how do we unlock gains like these? And number one that I just alluded to, and that you'll likely hear from Deirdre White about Pixar Global about later, 
is the skills that come for companies and their partners around cross-sector understanding and partnering and the hard work that that takes. Again, at, at Partner Day yesterday, we ran through a two-hour exercise that Pixera Global had put together that really illustrates the difficulty and challenges of partnering. And even though I work at a nonprofit myself, maybe I shouldn't be surprised anymore, but I am mystified by how low the understanding is of what a nonprofit actually is for anyone who's never worked in one. It is amazing to me. People in companies think, well, uh, so do you get money in a nonprofit? You, you're not paid, right, because you work in a nonprofit. I mean, it is amazing. So the, the, there is a disconnect between sectors uh, of even a basic understanding of what happens that needs to be addressed. And then number two, for all of you in the room who work at companies, is really what we call the shared value enterprise. How far has your company actually embedded shared value into competitive strategy and into the way you operate? And you can see with the three examples I've given, not only are decisions like that, repositioning the entire company, uh, pre-competitive collaboration with competitors that you normally go toe-to-toe -to -toe with, and sector-to-sector -sector in the YAR example, these decisions are being made at the highest levels of executive management as prioritized elements of corporate strategy that are about growth and differentiation for that business. So how far has your company come? Are, are social issues still off to the side and, and sometimes to be managed and minimized? Or are they a core part of profit and loss and the long-term vision and growth opportunities or risk management that you see within your businesses? And that progression of the enterprise and how it gets embedded strategic planning, goal setting, organizational design. This is the hard work that happens within companies, but that enables them to really make progress and take on these more aggressive, ambitious agendas for advancing their own goals at the same time that they advance societies. So now, in closing, let me just come back to the demand that I made of each of you. And I think it'll be great as we go through this day and hear all these great examples to come back to this key question, which is how far has your company, or if you're partnering with a company, how far have you come on this understanding, on your partnering skills, on shared value as an enterprise and really embedding it within your business? And to be clear, many companies have a lot of work to do and they're early in the process and early in the journey. But hopefully the three examples I've provided you give you a sense of where the leading companies are pushing and the aggressiveness and the intent in which they're pursuing these opportunities, again, as key differentiators in how they see their own growth and future prospects in this now, I would say, somewhat uncertain uh, business climate that we're all living in. So thank you very much for your attention. I really look forward to learning from all of you for the rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you very much. And it was a great and great insights into whether shared value is a language or shared value is a journey. And shared value as a language has been going on for a long time. And I, now I think the movement has started towards shared value as a journey. So now I will make the floor open for three to four questions which we can ask to Justin. And we can see how it goes. David. David Wilcox, Reach Scale. So I love the three examples um, because each one of them is an, is an outlier compared to the way you normally have the conversation in that situation. So the, the inclusive business supply chain conversation doesn't normally get to two and a half billion trees. Right. It's right. a thousand entrepreneurs and some entrepreneurial training programs. Right. The market development conversation doesn't usually get to the Yara type ecosystem wide marketing establishment opportunity, uh, or, or in the case of Enel, the market creation conversation doesn't usually lead companies to make that kind of shift right. and then reintegrate it. So, what do you see as the key differences? that resulted in those three examples getting to scale, if I can use my favorite term, whereas generally they don't. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Well, it's interesting. Thank you. It's a good question. I, I think there's a few things. And when, you know, for those of you who have followed the shared value work, when we published the original article in 2011 with Michael Porter and Mark Kramer, uh, you know, we, we stay, steered clear of the values language. And we said, it's all about making the business case. It's all about um, value creation. And certainly shared value in its DNA is about that. But you do see time and again uh, that the values and commitment of the leaders of these organizations uh, really help set the pathway. Now let me offer a couple of distinctions within that. So in NL, in that story, what you had is someone who was able to go out and obviously believed in green power as a growth opportunity. And I, I'm gonna emphasize growth opportunity because you can peel back the stories and, and draw a conception between which ones are growth opportunity focused and which ones are risk mitigation focused. And they sometimes take on a different light depending on which ones they were. But I think what's interesting about NL is the executive in that case, Mr. Storace, uh, had an opportunity to go out in a little bit of a shielded way but to build a successful business that could then show the entire company and the board that there was a pathway for this for the entire company. And, and that was what paved the way to then also think about how to redo the entire organization in Italy. By the way, I should add, uh, we just spent some time with them in Rome. And you know this process, I made it sound kind of good in the story, this process of the green power management team coming back into Italy is not with its own problems. As you can imagine, people who are used to running a utility company in one way don't necessarily want to hear about this new big thing. Um, so I do think uh, you know, leadership matters greatly, and I do have some concerns, I'll be honest with you, about that, because I've started calling it the Paul Pullman effect. And by that I mean, I, I feel like there's a relatively small number of corporate leaders who are present or ever present in almost every conversation, and I would love to see that number really grow. In the Coco story, it, what you clearly had was you have a risk story. And to give you a little bit of insight there, our work really started with the Mars Corporation as an individual organization, not in an industry collaborative. But we made the case for, for investment there really based in business terms. What was the risk to their business of the crop declining, of the quality declining, how much was it costing them, uh, what were different scenarios for where growth could or would go. And I'll be honest with you, when we do this work with companies, we try to be very pragmatic, which is to say, if that case cannot be made for an investment at scale, they're not gonna make an investment at scale. And so the risk had to be substantial enough to them, and what we determined through that process was, in effect, a risk that we could sell to the entire industry. And, but I'll be honest with you, if, if no one had believed that or it wasn't true, you would have ended up with, well, we're supporting 500 farmers, and it would have looked fine but it wouldn't have been substantial. So that's a couple of different answers to your question. Thank you. My name is Ravi Chaudhary from CNEXT Group. Uh, taking a, a global holistic view on the shared value initiative, which is remarkable initiative, it's generally still believed that it's a peripheral issue. Co corporates look at it more as a cosmetic issue to improve public image. Mm -hmm. The challenge that we have before us, and I'm grappling it with it as to how to get it going, is to how to make corporates transition from CSR mm -hmm. to SRC, mm -hmm. from mere hyped so corporate social responsibility to becoming a socially responsible corporation, which is something about the character of the organization, about the DNA mm -hmm. of its contribution to the society which enables it to function in the first place. Now, I, I came to the observation that we have to also graduate up from shared value to shared power. Shared what, I'm sorry? Shared value to shared power. Mm -hmm. Corporations wield enormous power. And I think they have to be willing to share a part of that power, which empowers others. In fact, by sharing power, we'll increase our own power, and we'll empower others. 
Now, I think one question, fourth question that I would like to add to your three is, each of these corporations need to consider what global problem, what societal problem they can solve. I firmly believe that every corporation with the right DNA has the ability, has the bandwidth, and can achieve the scale to solve at least one social problem in their society. Now that is, tell us how we go about it. Yeah, I, and I, on that last point, I'm, I'm with you. And the way I would characterize shared value right now is I still think, to be clear, we're in a moment of a relatively small number of, uh, to overused sort of business school term, but early adopters who are making progress and doing interesting things and really trying to transform their companies and what they do to address problems at scale with many businesses sort of on the side or not serious about it. So I've asked myself, you know, what is it that enables then the breakthrough? The breakthrough to much greater engagement with companies. And I have to tell you, you know, the, I don't think the news here is all good. I mean, I, I went to uh, an event during the UN General Assembly week that was hosted with major uh, Fortune 500 CEOs from all over the world. And it was all about the corporate social engagement agenda. And the entire conversation with that unbelievably powerful, to pick up on your word, audience, was a, a 101 conversation about the simplest things that companies could do that would really have no impact. And I was so frustrated because I sit in an audience like that and I think the power and the influence assembled in that room, I think the average CEO after hearing that conversation would sort of pat themselves on the back and say, well, we must have this topic all covered and I'm gonna go on with the rest of my life. So I think we're still marked by a period where a relatively small number of companies are doing substantial things and how do we break through? I think we break through, and Dr. DeBroy mentioned data this morning, everyone's favorite topic, but I think we break through when the companies who are the early leaders start to outcompete their competitors based on these initiatives and this approach to business. And when that starts to happen, it's amazing how quickly other companies will fall into line. I'll give you a simple example. We've partnered for the last two years with Fortune Magazine on this Change the World list. When we put it together in the first year, obviously there was no list. And we uh, just had to go out to all the companies we knew and we said, you know, we want you to submit information for this list and it's gonna be in Fortune Magazine. They said, okay, that's, that's great, thank you. Well then guess what? When the list came out and it was in a magazine, I guess somebody still reads magazines, I'm not sure who it is, but uh, when it was in a printed magazine, now all of a sudden it triggered competition. And for something as simple as wanting to be on a list in Fortune. And so this year when we came to the list in the second year, we were literally inundated with submissions and uh, you know, lobbying for inclusion in this list. So I think shared value is the same. I think we need to start raising up those companies that are winning and how by addressing big problems related to their business. And I think that will help either, um, you know, will indicate to others that they have to get on board as a mechanism of how competition happens. Thank you. And I'll be here all day, so I know there were some other questions. Please feel free just to grab me, and I'm happy to answer other. Thank you so much. It was great to be here.